Welcome, I'm Lena, and today we are going over Susie Orman's top 26 ways to save yourself from a financial disaster. I found this article on GoBankingRates.com and it is by Gabrielle Olia. I thought it would be fun to look at this article and see which one of these I'm doing and which ones I'm totally ignoring. First up is live within your means, but below your means. This is kind of a confusing statement, but the basic idea is yes, you still need to live somewhere and you need to eat, but really evaluating those things and seeing if you can lower those expenses. I guess I'm really taking this advice to heart because we have an Airbnb in part of our house and that basically covers the cost of our mortgage, which means we basically live here for free. So yes, even if you qualify for this huge mortgage, you might want to consider getting a smaller mortgage so that you have more wiggle room in your budget. And house hacking can be another great way to lower your essential costs. And that's what we've done with our Airbnb. If you want to learn more about the Airbnb, check out my Airbnb playlist. Next up is don't lease a car, buy a car. I don't actually know anyone who's ever leased a car. Uh, let me know down in the comments. Do you know people that lease cars? I don't know if it's just not a thing for my generation, but no one I know is actually leasing a car. We were able to buy both our cars with cash. We did have a lemon car before that we had a loan on and then we paid it off, but our cars are owned outright and we're just trying to fix them and make them last as long as possible. My husband is an auto technician, so that really helps out on the car front. Never thought about leasing a car. Next up is stop paying extra for minor inconveniences. So she wants to encourage people to not buy takeout and cook at home instead. But I don't know about you, but it takes a long time to cook at home. So I don't know about minor inconvenience, but it's definitely healthier to cook at home and it uh, saves you a bundle of money. And then she's also talking about ride the bus and don't take an Uber. But if you've ever taken the bus, it can take forever and I'm talking hours longer than it would for you to take an Uber. And if you need to get you to your job on time and you don't have extra hours to blow taking the bus, uh, maybe an Uber is a better option for that. I think my answer for this one is that it depends. Sometimes it's worth it to pay for that convenience if it can save you a significant amount of time and you can use that time productively. Next up is cut your coffee habit. This is a popular one in the finance community. They're always talking like, oh, if you just cut your coffee habit, then you will invest that money and you'll just become a millionaire before you know it. Whole books have been written about this idea of cutting your coffee habit so that you can become a millionaire. For example, this one, The Latte Factor, it is a good book and it's a short read. Cutting out your $3 or $4 a day coffee habit will not magically fix all your finances. And if you can invest that $4 that you would have spent every day on a coffee in your Roth IRA or something, yes, it will really get you farther along in your retirement plans. But I think this is kind of a stand-in statement for cut out the luxuries in your life or the excuses that people make about, oh, I don't have any money to invest. There's nothing else I can cut out. Um, so I think this coffee thing is just like about luxuries and stuff like that. Something that Ramit said that really struck me, this is not exact quote, but think about those $30,000 questions, not the $5 questions. If we spend too much time staring at the little bitty things, um, we're not focusing on the big picture. How are we going to pay off $30,000 of debt? Not how are we going to kick our $5 a day coffee hat? Next up is pay with debit instead of credit whenever possible. And this sounds like someone else you may know named Dave Ramsey, a credit card hater. <laughs> So I am not totally a credit card hater, but if you carry a balance and you pay 15% interest, yes, I am a credit card hater of that. The interest rates on credit cards are obnoxious. So definitely avoid that interest at all costs. And if you know yourself to not be able to control yourself when you have a credit card in your hand, maybe you need to go all debit. Next up is to pay your student loans on time. I think it's great to make a habit of paying all your bills on time because it can really hurt your credit and your ability to take out loans or buy a house later if you are not paying on time. 
Next up is get out of debt ASAP. And I am all for this. We paid off our consumer debt a few years ago and it felt so good to have that weight lifted. Orban says, quote, when you're in debt, you can feel it, end quote. And if you are looking for resources about the best way and quickest way to pay off your debt, Dave Ramsey is a great resource. No, I don't agree with everything he ever says, but he has some great resources to help you get serious about paying off your consumer debt. Next up is set up automatic deposits into your savings account. The idea of this is just to help you stay consistent with your savings goal. And for us, this this means we have a set amount that we are planning to contribute to our Roth IRAs every month and that is an automatic withdrawal so we don't have to do anything about it we don't have to remember we don't have to like feel in a good mood to transfer that money it just happens automatically and it's in our budget like whether you like it or not we're putting that money in that Roth IRA. So I think that automatic um, transfer really cuts down on the amount of thinking you have to do when you're thinking about saving. So wherever you're trying to move your money, and maybe right now you're working on your emergency savings and you're putting it in your savings account. Maybe you're working on your student loans. Maybe you're working on your retirement savings. Whatever it is, you can make some amount of that automatic so that it'll just happen and then you won't forget about it Next up, have eight months of expenses saved in an emergency fund. I love emergency funds. I think they save us from so much disaster. How much that should be is a debate among all the people in the financial community. Uh, Dave Ramsey would say like three to six months, I think. She's saying eight months. Maybe that's just a happy medium. It's a little bit more. I also think it depends on what your job is like. If you have a W-2 job, you might consider keeping less in your emergency savings than if you are self-employed. Maybe you want an entire year of emergency savings. If you are self-employed and you're worried about where the industry may take you. Next up is follow your instincts. So listen to your gut when your gut is telling you that this is a bad decision or you shouldn't loan this money to your friend. I think this can be super useful because every single financial choice you make is gonna be different than the financial choices that other people have to make and I have to make. So I can't just give you a blanket statement about what to do with your money because your money and your circumstances are different. So yes, you can learn as much as you can about money and what things would help you. Um, uh, but in the end, you're going to have to make those day-to-day -day decisions. Next up is never co-sign a loan. This can get you into so much trouble because it can hurt your credit. And then before you know it, you are on the hook for someone else's debt. And then you get to pay it off. <laughs> and then if they didn't make the payments on time, then that will ding your credit. Don't rush into buying a home. So I think sometimes people can get caught up in the American dream of buying and owning a home and that it's just gonna be so great. And yeah, sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes it doesn't actually make sense to own a home. The other thing about owning a home is that you're responsible for all those repairs and those can be a lot of money. Let's say your hot water tank goes out. Well, when you're a renter, you call the landlord and they come and fix it. It's super cool. If you own the house, you call the repairman and they say, that'll be $8,000. How would you like to pay? <laughs> And that can be really painful. So this is all dependent on your circumstances, your financial circumstances, and what you're feeling up for and what your market is like. So yes, don't rush into buying a home. Next up, if you're new to investing, go with a low risk option. And I like this uh, caveat of that if you're new to investing. So we want everyone to get started in investing earlier because most of the game is about getting in and staying in for the long term. So if you can do that, you can really watch your money grow. But if you're new to investing, definitely start with something that you're comfortable with and something that's diversified like an index fund or a mutual fund or something so that it's not too scary. But as you're going along, you'll learn more things and you'll decide different things perhaps. Be patient when it comes to long-term investing. This can really be a hard one when the market is just up and down every single day. But my best piece of advice about this is just don't look. I mean, definitely check on your portfolios once in a while to make sure that everything looks on the up and up and your money actually got invested. 
but I definitely wouldn't check every day because that'll just give you anxiety. And if you're in this for the long term, we're talking 30, 40, 50 years, you just need to leave it and uh, move on with your life. Next up is don't underestimate how long you may live in retirement. I don't really think about this very often, but this is a really good point. If you estimate that you live till 90, you've planned that your money is gonna run out exactly when you turn 90, but if you outlive your retirement plans, that would be such a bummer. And then suddenly your money runs out and then you're in big trouble. So yeah, don't underestimate how long you can live. Next up is lower the fees on your investment funds. So look for funds that have low expense ratios and keep that in mind as you're investing because over time, this money can really add up. Next up, don't forget to roll over your 401ks. 401ks do not just follow you automatically and we actually need to do that because my husband just got a new job and we haven't rolled over his 401k yet. We need to get on that. Choose your 401k's cheapest options. This kind of goes with the other one that I was talking about is watch those fees in your retirement accounts because they can really add up. Next up is that she advises that you do use a financial advisor, but you are careful to vet them first. And the kind that she recommends is a fiduciary one, which means you pay them for their time and they don't make money off any of the financial products that they sell to you. So say you have an hour meeting with them and you pay them $100. This means that they don't make more money if they sell you a program or a fund or a stock or anything like that. They are just paid off the fact that they were there and they were talking to you. Next up is get healthy. And her reason for this is a little different than mine would be, but hers is that if you take prescription drugs, they can be really expensive and it really adds up. But my reason for staying healthy would be so that I can actually enjoy my retirement and enjoy my whole life. Because if you're not healthy and you're sick, one, it's expensive with the prescription drugs, the trips to the doctor's office, but also you're not enjoying your life when you are sick. Prioritize retirement funds before college funds. I think this is a really good point because if my husband and I can't take care of ourselves, it doesn't matter if we were able to help our children with college, they're gonna have to start helping us and start taking care of us, maybe while they're still in college. But if we can be self-sustaining, then if they decide to go to college, maybe we'll have something to help them, maybe we won't, but they could also take out a loan, but they won't feel burdened uh, having to help us out. Pay off all your debts before you retire. This is a no brainer to me because paying off your debts frees up so much headspace for me. We paid off our debts before we started saving for retirement, but I also wanna think about the emotional benefit of not being in debt and being able to enjoy your retirement if you are feeling burdened by your debts or your big monthly outgo. It feels harder to just relax and have a nice retirement. Delay collecting social security benefits until you're after 70. The idea about this one is that just you are allowing your Roth IRA or 401k to get as big as possible before you start making withdrawals. So you're trying to avoid it until the last minute. There are times when you have to start making withdrawals, the minimum uh, required withdrawals. So watch out for those rules, but she's suggesting to delay that as long as possible. Don't take out a reverse mortgage in your 60s. So Susie doesn't want a reverse mortgage to be part of your retirement plan because you can get in trouble with a reverse mortgage. But basically what a reverse mortgage is, is that your house is paid off and you mortgage it again and you do a reverse mortgage so that you are paying a very small amount monthly and maybe you're just paying the interest on your mortgage, but you are getting the equity out of your house and you are living off of that equity. But that can backfire pretty fast if you have a lot of years left and then you will have all that principal which is not paid off. And it really depends on the value of your house, how fast you will run through all of your equity. Next up is make sure you have these four documents for estate planning. And the documents she thinks you should have are a will, a revocable trust, financial power of attorney, and durable power of attorney for health care. So these are just the minimum documents that you should think about when you're thinking that maybe you are getting close 
to the end of your time here on earth. I think that's a really helpful list. We do not have all of these documents, but I need to look more into these and figure out what we need to do about some of these. We do have a will, but that's it. And it doesn't matter how much money you make, you can still be smart with your money. If you're making $300,000 and you blow $300,000, you can get yourself in some serious trouble real fast. If you're making $50,000 and you're spending $40,000, you can make headway on your financial goals, your debt payoff, your down payment uh, plans, your retirement goals, whatever they are, you can make progress on that. So more money doesn't fix all the problems. It, more money can definitely make things a little bit easier and give you a little bit more wiggle room, but learn those financial skills no matter your budget, no matter your income, and they will serve you even if your income greatly expands. Let us know in the comments which one of these financial tips is most important for you right now in the phase of life that you are in. Like this video, subscribe for more, hope to see you in the next one. Bye for now. <music>